Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Nostalgia Trap Podcast. My name is David Parsons, and I am happy that you have found the show and hopefully enjoying the conversations I have with all these different kinds of folks. Uh, Usually, I talk to uh, professors, academics, writers, uh, filmmakers, activists, people um, engaged in, in, in kind of an adult world, uh, if, you, if you will. Uh, but, but sometimes I like to talk to the students on this show, and I think it's valuable to talk to the people who were actually uh, trying to make an impact on uh, and, and, and figure out what they're saying and, and what their lives are about, and particularly how they're coming to terms with the information and the techniques that we as educators are inflicting upon them uh, each semester. Today's show uh, uh, is, is an opportunity to hear students talking about and coming to terms with the, the topic of climate change, which is obviously kind of a, 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 a becoming a, 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 a huge a uh, piece of not only our political but our, our kind of uh, you know our social and economic lives as well. I think that we'll be talking about climate change pretty much uh, the whole time we're alive here on this planet. And the students uh, in this in this episode are students in Justin Rogers Cooper's English 101 class at LaGuardia Community College. Uh, you shouldn't be surprised that it's LaGuardia, obviously, a school that is near and dear to this show. Um, and Justin Rogers Cooper should be known to a few of you. He's a good, very good friend of mine and and and, and someone who uh, appeared quite a bit on my old show. Uh, I, I say old show, I think it was last year, called Topical Fever. So Google Topical Fever, Justin Rogers Cooper, and you can hear us talking about all sorts of wacky stuff. Um, but Justin invited me to his English 101 class to kind of show off these students that had uh, been been writing all semester and reading all semester about climate change, and it was amazing to talk to them. There uh, there were stories from uh, Hurricane Sandy uh, that that blew my mind. That students that are in our classrooms went through the kinds of things that the students in this episode describe. Uh, there's a student who wrote a poem who was inspired enough to write a poem about climate change, and he shares it at the beginning of the show. Um, it's the, the, the recording is a little bit rough, so you might have to adjust your volume here and there, but I think what comes through is uh, how amazing these students uh, are and how they, you know, they are processing really, really challenging information, not only in an abstract sense, but, but living it in their lives. They all were touched by Hurricane Sandy in one way or another. Um, and and it, it, I think it's just an awesome opportunity to, to be able to hear the voices of students at the City University of New York, particularly at LaGuardia Community College, and, 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 and figuring out, you know, what their lives are about and, and, and where they're at. And for me, you know, someone asked me a while ago, you know, uh, uh, if the kids were all right, you know, if, you know, David, you're in contact with people who are 18 to 21 all the time. Are they really that lost millennial generation that's just a bunch of idiots staring at their phones, uh, narcissistic, lost, selfish, hopeless, lazy, etc., and all the things that people say about young people? And, I, you know, I, I, I have to fight that stereotype uh, because... Uh, and resist that stereotype because I, I, I live the opposite of that every day. I, I see young people who are engaged, who are scared uh, of what's of, of the world that's around them, that want to do things to change the world around them, uh, and, that, and are really like struggling very hard uh, uh, um, to come to terms with the, the shitty situation that they've inherited. I think people tend to forget uh, how... Uh, how hard it is to be 20 years old, uh, and, and, and in particular, uh, being 20 years old in a, in a world that is as broken as ours. Um, and these students at LaGuardia seem to know that and are, uh, and are facing that head on. And in, this, in, in these interviews, you, you can hear that, some of that shine through. So at the, you know, at the expense of, of sounding, at the, or at the risk of, of sounding cheesy, you know, um, I am really thankful that I get to that I hang out with young people and not and not you know form my my images of young people from from just uh, I guess media stereotypes etc. Uh, um, it's it's enriching to be around them and I hope you enjoy listening to me talk to CUNY students about climate change. You can find more episodes of the Nostalgia Trap on iTunes. You can go to the blog at nostalgiatrap.libsyn.com. You can find episodes on Stitcher.com on podbay.fm and of course like the the nostalgia trap facebook page for updates on new episodes and other stuff from me uh leave a comment 
put a review on iTunes, uh, interact with the show in any way that you deem appropriate. I would love to hear more uh, from the audience because I know you are out there. Uh, So I hope you enjoy this episode. This is me talking to the students of LaGuardia Community College about climate change and the future of planet Earth. This is an English 101 class here at LaGuardia Community College, and our focus over the course of this semester, in addition to learning very basic uh, skills about uh, argumentative essays and uh, expository college writing, has been on climate change. And Mm -hmm. so we've had three different writing assignments. Uh, One was about New York City being prepared for climate change. That was a letter to the mayor. which our current we, which mayor? We, which, yeah, our current mayor, which we need to send, and hopefully people will. There is extra credit involved. Um, our second assignment was on Hurricane Sandy, mm-hmm. and the students had kind of a balanced perspective saying, in some ways, the city's response was very uh, meaningful, it was very efficient, it was yeah. very adequate. And in other ways, the students came upon research that suggested the city could have improved its response to Hurricane Sandy. Uh, and then our final assignment, the one we're turning in today, is based off of our reading of the book Zaytun by Dave Eggers, mm-hmm. and it was asking students, hey, after reading this book, uh, are there lessons in here from Zaytun and Kathy's experience, yeah. uh, the experience of going through New Orleans, are there lessons in here for us as New Yorkers? Yeah. And I haven't had a chance to you know, look at those essays yet as, uh, in terms of ev- evaluating them because they're just coming in. Uh, but that's what the class has been focused on. It's been, a, it's been a nice semester. It's a good group of students. They've been very engaged with the material in different kinds of ways. Uh, there's a lot of unique ideas floating around, and I've been really impressed in the whole with their dedication, their research, and their uh, development as writers as well. Cool. Sounds great. I'm looking forward to uh, uh, hearing from some of you. I wanted to ask, uh, did, you, did you guys get to talk a little bit about your own experience with Sandy, too? Like like uh, a little bit? Or was it more like uh, anal- analyzing other folks' experiences? I say that because, you know, we, we, uh, all of us were here, right? Some of us? Some of us were, some of us some weren't. Of us weren't. Um, and I think, s- you know, it, w- it was more analytical, the assignment, which yeah. was to say, what was the city's response? Yeah. And who was included in the city's uh, response and who maybe who wasn't? Yeah. At the same time, some students did bring in their personal experiences, and, s- and some students do have very relevant personal experiences that cool. informed our discussion, and maybe they can they can talk about that when they get up here. Yeah, yeah. And I say that because I, th- I was, you know, in the city when Hurricane Sandy happened, and I was going to, I was very much looking forward to, you know, having an experience to tell, you know, my parents back home or whatever, like, I survived Hurricane Sandy, but I was in Sunset Park um, in Brooklyn, which is like up on a hill. We never lost electricity. We never lost water. We never had to fill the bathtub. I was streaming Netflix the entire time, and I felt like really, really, it was an odd feeling. I think my experience of Sandy was ended up being different than the experience of lots of people right around me. And I think that um, the one thing that, that, that came up with, with Justin, I'm sorry, I call, I call him Justin a lot. Uh, um, is that is that the the idea that um, you know we all experience quote unquote apocalypse you know Sandy whatever you want to call it in different ways like some of us in the same city will experience it in very different ways than others and you know you saw it in Zaytun and other and others so I'm joined by my first guest here and you can speak a little bit into the microphone what's your name Good afternoon my name is Ruben Aponte Ruben uh, and and this is um, is this your first year at LaGuardia. Yes. Yes. Uh, um, and you, you uh, Justin tells me that you wrote a poem about, about uh, is it about climate change or about Sandy? It was more after reading the book Zaytun, it, was, yeah. it became amused to create this poem about what I felt, what I learned about climate change. Mm, yeah, uh, that book Zaytun, you all read parts of it, right? The, um, I, 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 that book was... Um, my, my wife also works at LaGuardia, and so this book has been around for a while. LaGuardia, like, puts it in the, like, uh, it's, a, it's a book that many people at LaGuardia have read. And it, it just happened to be on, uh, on my desk uh, when I was sick last year. And I had a couple days, and I just, like, started cracking open. I wonder what this is. And it's one of those books that just, like, kind of blew my mind in terms of reading that narrative and seeing this, like, t- it was a page turner for me because it has a kind of novelistic thing. It's unbelievable this happened to this guy. Um, so I want to hear, like, what the, it, because it sounds like, you know, you were also inspired by this book. Um, so so what it, w- can you read your poem for me? Would that be okay? Absolutely. Okay. I've titled the poem, Zeatum, the Book of Revelation. 
Cool, go ahead. Us, seeds of society, pondering in the fathoms of a bottomless imagination, deciding whether this visualization of the future would be grim and dark as the oil dripping from the gears of present time into the land we consume. You're not immune to the dirty fumes that cause this planet we call home to be gloom. Impending doom coming soon for not realizing tipping points undermined by political lies, keeping the youth from using their mind's eye from becoming modern day Einsteins. Mm. Society seeking salvation from underneath this boulder we carry on our shoulders for not transitioning to solar. Our hearts becoming colder. Boulder has become soldiers obeying orders destroying the planet's natural order. Yet imagination tells us there still is hope for the seeds of tomorrow. No shackles can restrain our kind from combining. Enlightenment. Inch by inch, the boulder that lay on top of our shoulders crumbles, mm. and a beautiful rose takes its divine position underneath the sun. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Um, really I- impressive imagery there. You know, it makes me think of, um, I don't know how, how familiar you are with, like, Allen Ginsberg and that kind of poetry from the 60s, but that, that, that f- it's dystopic a little bit. I know this is heavy stuff we're talking about in this class, uh, and, and I, you know, I can always count on uh, uh, Professor Rogers Cooper to, to bring that, that kind of, like, I don't know. There's a feeling of importance here. Uh, uh, what we're talking about is not uh, is not uh, uh, the latest iPhone. We're talking about some really heavy stuff. Um, so, you know, how, how are you? How did you come to terms with this in this class? Is it something that was like new information to you, or is it uh, something that you had already kind of read a little bit about? Well, actually, uh, from a very young age, my inspiration has been to become an environmental engineer. Mm. So, my field is based on this high, this entire idea. Yeah. Yeah. What I found from Zayatun as the most significant idea was that I believe that the book wanted to teach Americans that in times of climate disasters, authorities take advantage of certain rights to obtain unquestionable power. Mm. I also feel that instead of becoming extremists who believe in the solution would be revolting against democracy, the solution lies in working together as communities to revise, to revise, the solution lies in working together as communities to revise parts of the constitutions, mm. such as the National Defense Authority, the solution lies in working together as communities to revise parts of the Constitution, mm. such as the National Defense Authorization Act, yeah. so that the liberty that is promised by the Constitution is provided to all individuals, no matter what gender or ethnicity. Mm. Yeah, that, that that's great, and that book that book Zaytun really combines all those things. Like it's not it's not like we're living in uh, all these the realities are necessarily separate. That like climate change is not connected to, you know, homeland security is not connected to, uh, you know, race and the, and the, the kind of social ideas in America. It seems like it's all that's why climate change to me. And I, I'm having a hard time seeing everyone, but I am talking to you a little bit. Uh, uh, that climate change to me is a, is. Um, you know, a, a great topic for kind of combining all of what we call our problems. Um, thank you for joining me. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Hi, how's it going? I'm good. How are you? Good. What's your name? Uh, my name is Jeremy Soto. Jeremy. Um, so what was this class like for you uh, in terms of climate change? Was this new stuff for you? Uh, the topic itself of climate change? Yeah. Uh, I'm ran into it occasionally here and there and yeah. never really dwelled deeper into it than anything of faith value but right um i i knew it existed yeah um was this w- did you did you find this class like heavy or depressing in some in some respects because uh, in a way like it sh- we we have to avoid that you know what i mean <laughs> when we're talking about this kind of stuff we can't just be like oh god it's <laughs> the end of the world yeah yeah absolutely um i remember coming to the class expecting english 101 yeah uh stories papers mm-hmm wanting to kill myself yeah that, that's <laughs> right. what i expected but uh, right. i came in the first day and kind of was thrown off you know just from the introduction of the subject matter yeah. of climate change itself and uh there was a few times uh, especially after our first essay that we brought in yeah um that it made me really question a lot of things mm. in terms of like i'm really really depressed after this essay mm. and that's mm-hmm. gonna be for the whole semester yeah because it uh, opened my mind up to a lot of possibilities and a lot of other options that didn't seem viable or yeah. even possible yeah that's cool uh, um so uh, w- what was it about that first essay that did that um it it was the first time actually st- i guess really really stepping into the topic of climate change right to really know what it was about to actually understand what it meant because we did mm. have to write a letter slash essay to the mayor about yeah. the yeah. issue of climate change and how it affects us so it made us think about it a lot a lot more br- on a broader yeah. perspective than we ha- 
than I have before in terms of, okay, well, now I have to see the problem. After seeing the problem, I have to somehow suggest a solution to the problem mm -hmm. to somehow help a whole city uh, of people, some who live co closer to the coast, yeah. some who live further, right. some who are just a little better off financially, mm -hmm. some who are worse off. Yeah. So it really made you start, it made me at least start thinking about, okay, there's a lot of stuff going on with this topic and mm -hmm. we're just scratching the surface. Yeah. Even after, I guess, this being the end of the semester, we're still just scratching the surface. Yeah, no, I feel like I am too. And I feel like in a lot of ways, I'm really interested in this topic, but you guys probably have read at this point more about it than I have in a lot of respects because I, I haven't been, uh, you know, forced to in a in a class pers in, in a in a class context to, to read all this stuff um what what did you suggest to to mayor de blasio what was like the main point of your your letter do you remember uh there was a few things all over the place with that one um one of the main suggestions was that maybe to actually combat the problem of climate change is going to take some sort of awareness mm -hmm. so if we can make people more aware of this uh that maybe we'd have a better chance of people wanting to do the part yeah right to actually correct the problem mm -hmm. um another one of the, my suggestions were that uh after we raise awareness you know some people are going to want to probably get involved yeah in the, proactively solving the problem but you know in new york and a lot of other cities around the u.s you know people can't afford to go to school mm -hmm. to actually learn what needs to be done or the steps that need to be taken to combat the problem so one of my <laughs> one of my i guess potential solutions was maybe some sort of a tax break for educational institutions. Yeah, yeah. And they'll allow a student who wants a major either in environmental science or in some way help in terms of emergency planning or whatever yeah, yeah. the case may be, that they'll let them go to school for free and help them out with job placement afterwards if they want to actually take that subject up. And, you know, for the school who isn't seeing the money out of the tuition, mm -hmm. they get that tax break. It might help. It might help them out with other finances. That's a great idea. I mean, that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. Like, I, I tend to talk about climate change in a very kind of like abstract way. It's like, oh well, you know, you know, in the, on the macro level, human humanity is done. We'll never, you know, we we need a spaceship basically to get us to another planet um, and, and fast. But but that's what I'm talking about. Is like kind of that's a practical idea. You know, that's something that like we can actually do. So like this perspective is really important to me. Thank you so much. Hey, for no joining me. You. Yeah. Good afternoon. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Uh, what's your name? Cecil. Cecil. Nice to meet you. Um, so you, you came to this climate change stuff in this class, too. Um, do you remember what you wrote in your letter to, to Mayor de Blasio? Um, uh, the first essay? Yeah, the first essay. Because, you know, I think of like, uh, uh, um, you know, advice for politicians and it's kind of it's kind of an amazing thing that you guys wrote it in the form of a letter. I think it's a really great assignment. Um, do you remember what you would say to the mayor? Um, I remember writing about uh, uh, suggesting uh, stuff mm -hmm. that's from Plan NYC 30. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> So, wh wait, what is Plan NYC 30? Can you tell me a little bit about that? Maybe Justin can explain. Or it. Um, it's about projects mm -hmm. that will solutionize the problem with global warming. Mm, okay. Like eliminating emissions. Uh, okay, and is it, is it specifically for New York, though? Yes. Is that right? Um, were you in New York when, Hur when Hurricane Sandy happened? Actually, no. No? Uh, um, what, what, what did you write about when you wrote about Hurricane Sandy? Um, I wrote about... Um, I mean, I'm, we read about um, some people's um, experiences mm. about uh, um, Hurricane Sandy. Where did you find those, th those experiences? Um, Online? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. um, then I wrote about people's experiences and how they deal deal with the uh -huh. pro, um the hurricane <laughs> yeah yeah uh um so you know did you read did you read zaytun too yes yeah um and what did you uh, what did that book do for you did that book scare you were you bored by it what was that what was that <laughs> book for you um it was actually um um i like it um it's kind of 
it's entertaining. Mm -hmm. It's um, once you get into it, mm -hmm. you just can't stop reading. Yeah, it. I felt that way too. Yeah, um, I mostly don't read like reading books, mm -hmm. but that book made me like read. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I think the story I shared just now was kind of, uh, and I just, it feels absurd saying as a professor, I don't read books that often. I do. <laughs> um, but but this book in particular was one that I was like, I want to read the whole thing. I want to sit here and not just read a review of it or something and mm -hmm. find out like what actually happened. Um, so is climate change something that you're more concerned about now after taking this class? Yes. Yeah. It made me aware of what are the consequences mm -hmm. we might face mm -hmm. if we don't take action? Yeah. Uh, you know, um, global warming is happening and people don't really, um, like, the, uh... <laughs> There's a w awareness is part of it, right? Like mm -hmm. people don't know. Do you think it's a do, do you think it's an individual thing that needs to change? Like everybody everybody has to do something differently and live differently, or is it more like something that like what you're talking about, where we have to like structure, you know, corporations and tell them not to, you know, change their emission standards and stuff like that? Do we do, do we need to live differently? Yes, I think um, we need to change our practices mm -hmm. um, as well as other. Um, billions of people's practices yeah. to like um, see improvements yeah. with the uh, climate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, there's just, uh, uh, it's it's an enormously complex problem. I think this is why it's a good um, subject for a writing class because you can take any angle on this. I mean, we can write poems about it. We can sing songs about it. We can also come up with uh, you know political programs around it. Um, thank you so much for sharing your ideas. Thank Appreciate you. It. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Good, you? Good. So you are Andrew? Yep. Is that right? Uh, um, so Andrew, how, how, did, how did this class happen for you? Uh, um, was climate change something that was a new topic for you or something you'd heard about before? I've heard about it before, but I never really gave it any thought. Yeah. Uh, um, so even when Hurricane Sandy happened, were you here when that happened? No, but my family was here. Okay. Um, what, what, what was their experience? Did they, did they stream Netflix the whole time, or did they have uh, th things happen in, in their house that, that were problems for them not so much in the house but in terms of getting to work yeah and trying to make money to pay the bills yeah it was really difficult because there, there was no gas mm -hmm. stores mm -hmm. were shut down yeah I, I mean I remember seeing I don't know how many of you saw in your neighborhood like people lined up for gas it was a very kind of like disturbing sight to see in New York uh, that uh, we kind of take for granted that like the spigots are just going to flow all the time. Uh, um, so what did you what did you write about when you wrote to de Blasio? Do you remember what you suggested? Yeah, a lot of what I suggested was uh, just like Jeremy, tax breaks, but yeah. not tax breaks for people who are trying to earn education. Like tax break for homeowners who want to put solar panels or people, people who use electric mm. cars. Mm -hmm. You know, they should get in incentives for these things, yeah. maybe less at, at the meters so that they'll get cheaper parking so that they have incentive to use these electric cars. Yeah, yeah. It's the, the carrot and the stick approach a little bit, right? Where you give them a little, you have, to, you have to kind of, it seems like we can't just ask people to, to do things, right? Like it, it seems like that's not the way things work, at least in the United States. Uh, um, so you read Zaytun? Yes. Um, did you, uh, w was that something you had, you had thought about before, the connection between like security and, and class and all that kind of stuff? Was that something that was new to you? Um, not really. You'd heard, you've heard of these stories before? Yeah, kind of. Yeah. Uh, um, what about New York City? How do you think New York is, is ready for climate change? Do you think New York's in a good position for it or, or we need to do, we need to change radically? Oh no, New York needs to change drastically yeah prepare for climate change yeah because once the subways get taken out you take out the entire city once the transit lines are gone the city's gone do you know justin and i have talked about that a lot the, the that the city kind of the subway is the heartbeat of the city in a lot of ways and you know i live i told you in sunset park where the r train has been cut off since sandy like our train does not cross underneath anymore uh it goes over the bridge on the weekends but it, that tunnel that r train tunnel has been closed since sandy and it's kind of a disturbing thing to think to just see that that little line just knocked out and, and and to think that if if, if it, that that process continued and we had another storm where five lines are knocked out and there's no n train or q train anymore 
I mean, it'd be kind of, I think all of us would be kind of like, well, do I need to leave New York City? Can I even be here anymore? Um, and I, I, I like that you, you connect it to, you know, in your own family, the idea of just getting to work and making money. I mean, that's kind of like vital. If you can't get to your job, you're not going to have your job anymore. Um, and so transportation seems like it's pretty key. Mm -hmm. Thanks for joining me. Appreciate oh, it. Oh, thanks for having me. Good afternoon. Hi. Good afternoon. What's your name? My name is Tanya. Tanya. Nice to meet you. Uh, nice to meet you too. Um, how, how are you from New York City originally? Yes, I am. Born and raised. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, you have some stake in this a little bit. Uh, um, I think we, we all feel some kind of connection to this city. Um, wh wh what was this class like for you in terms of coming to climate change? Is it something that you th thought about in connection in New York specifically before? Um, climate change honestly wasn't something that I thought about at mm -hmm. all. Yeah. Which now that I say I'm kind of embarrassed about it because how can I not think about something that is so important to mm -hmm. my life and the fu future lives? Of sure. People? Yeah. Um, but coming into cl this class, it opened my eyes to see that you, I need to be more aware of what's going on in like the environment and mm -hmm. around me. Mm -hmm. So it actually it benefited me and I. Enjoyed yeah. it. Good. I mean, it sounds like it benefited all of us too, because like the more people we have that think that way, uh, you know, the more we have we have a chance of surviving. But mm -hmm. it seems like uh, um, you kind of got to overcome a little bit of uh, of of the individual in in America and in New York. We're all we're all hustling, trying to do our own thing, right? Like, and you and you get involved in that. Um, it, it can be easy. I don't think you need to be too embarrassed. I think like you can, <laughs> it's pretty easy to ignore all that stuff and just want to play on your iPhone. I mean, it, yeah. it's very appealing, you know, and it, it's like, who wants to think about the end of the world type stuff? I feel like maybe if we make it fun, we make it entertaining, make it, uh, you know, incentivized the way many of you have put it, we have to find a way to like make this a happy thing rather than an opportunity, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, did you write a letter to de Blasio? Do you remember what you said? Yes, I did write a letter, and I know that I told I didn't really want them to feel like they weren't doing anything at all. So I yeah. made sure to point out some good things that I did find on Plan mm -hmm. NYC that the were steps to take to improve. Y but I also told them that awareness is something that we do need to work on. Yes, like I said, I wasn't too aware of global warming, and it's mainly because it wasn't really thrown at me as much as it probably should have. Been. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I feel like a lot of people think this way, and also I remember writing to them saying that there was this plan that they have about planting like. A million trees which mm -hmm. was interesting to me and i have recently like seen this happening and i have a friend who volunteered to plant trees around New York. yeah City. i saw in uh, in my neighborhood just the other day they had a truck that said to, uh, like the honorable mayor de blasio on it and i was like oh <laughs> de blasio came to my neighborhood to plant some trees yeah i, I saw yeah, that um i feel like that's very interesting mm -hmm. um it is a good plan but we also we need to like like add on to it like there it's not planting a million trees can help but it's not going to be the thing that solves the problem entirely how do we get awareness beyond just college classics because not everyone's in college there are a lot of people that are older you know um, honestly i feel like it should be a requirement in high school uh, yeah because, i mean part of the curriculum it should yeah. be honestly because um, when we study like earth science this is a part of like earth science living environment all, and mm -hmm. it, it I don't remember ever talking about it at all, not even once while I was in school. And yeah. I think that should it, it connects to the topic, so why not we talk about it, especially since it's going on now? Well, I mean, it, it, it's really something very, very recent, you know, that people are talking about. I would say Hurricane Sandy really brought, I mean, that was when, um, hur when Hurricane Sandy happened, that was when, uh, what, Chris Christie endorsed Obama over that weekend, and it was like, oh, we got to do something about climate change. Bloomberg said the same thing, and it was like a big moment because it was like New Yorkers don't want to hear about anything unless it affects New York City, so it's like, <laughs> okay, like time to do something about this. Um, uh, all right, well, what, I want to ask you one more thing about, like, uh, uh, culture. You know, like, what about, did you guys watch movies about this? Did you watch documentaries? Mm -hmm. No, you usually, sh don't you show that Leonardo DiCaprio documentary, The Eleventh Hour? No, I didn't show this time. Didn't show it this time? <laughs> I'm just, uh, I guess I'm just good, uh, trying to think of, like, political songs and stuff like that. I know it sounds corny if there were, like, you know, a song or something. Because it seems like people have tried that around pol political change, too. It's just, mm -hmm. like... Uh, there has to be different cha ways to get people aware of that idea. Um, in terms of culture, I just feel like the culture of like America and all, mm -hmm. and uh, other places around the city is probably what needs to be changed drastically for like global warming and climate change yeah. to be solved. Because I think about like 
what, are, what is one thing that's of low cost that can actually solve the solution? It's really changing everybody's lives. Like, everybody has to become more spiritual, and everybody mm. needs to be more connected with their environment and to be able to understand, like, the harm that we do. Like, um, it was one of my first blogs I remember writing that, um, are we going through climate change because of industrialization? Mm, mm-hmm. it's like, should we go back to becoming cavemen? Yeah. Can that save the planet? Well, there's too many people to be, there'd be too many cavemen at this yeah. point, you know? So, yeah. So like, that's the thing. Now it's just, it's Maybe. <laughs> oh, this, is a, this is the heart of the conversation, what you're talking about. Like, we have six, seven billion people on the planet now because of industrialization, because mm-hmm. because of all, like, the things that have made the, this, the, the world more modern. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the paradox uh, is that industrialization also undermined the very land we're, we're on. And so, yeah, we, we find ourselves in a really... Big paradox, and I think you identified one there. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah. A little bit used to this. What's your name? Um, my name is Sanjita. Sanjita, uh, thanks for joining me. Thank you. Um, so, you know, was this uh, was this new stuff for you? Climate change was it overwhelming to hear about this stuff, or are you like already an expert on it? No, I heard about global warming, mm-hmm. but it really never caught my attention. So this class changed my like my thinking drastically mm-hmm. like right now after reading Zaytun writing my letter to mayor and everything um everything that I talk about at home is about climate change mm-hmm. the other day I was talking to my I was asking both my parents like if if we are hit by category five hurricane um do we have a place to evacuate yeah. where do we go what do we do like what do we take and everything how does your family react to that kind of talk um you're like, what are you talking yeah, please, about? Like, yeah. please, like, can we just listen to music and yeah, everything? Yeah, two and a half men is on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> like, my sister gets really annoyed, but I was like, I really pushed that thought to my dad. I was like, what are we going to do if, if like, the building that we live in, it's mm-hmm. really old. And if we are hit, what's going to happen yeah so he was like oh probably we'll just go to the place where government is keeping everyone i'm like but you do know that a lot of people will be there are we ready for that Mm -hmm. what will we do so well we saw that in katrina right i mean the, the, I think the number one lesson I learned from Katrina is that the government might tell you to go somewhere and they don't necessarily have the plan figured out. I mean, you, you guys saw that, right? Like the, the, the biggest image for me is the one where they told the, everyone to line up on the freeway and buses will come pick them up. And like three days later, the people are still sitting out there on the freeway. Um, you know, if I saw the signs that the government was like, everyone go to Barclay Center. I think I'm going the other way. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't know if I'm necessarily heading towards Barclay Center. Is that what what would your plan be? I like that thought in my head like if we're hit I don't know what to do yeah so that is really scary yeah well it's like Zaytun you know he he didn't go right he didn't do what the government told him and look what happened you know he like he was detained yeah. and being a Muslim it <laughs> it's more scary that yeah. what if I stay behind and I get detained right and right what's going to happen to my family and everything. It's, sc- yeah, so. it's a scary thought. Um, and, and one that I think uh, we all think about, it. anyone who read that book kind of understands that like, it was a chaotic moment, you know, in Katrina. And, and, and the, the, the stain of the war on terror on the Muslim population in the United States was still very much active when Katrina happened. I mean, I think I remember Hurricane Katrina as like a big event in the George W. Bush administration. Uh, uh, um, so, you know, it, is that it, do you think you would be you would be the person that would that would uh stay behind and help no, or you no, know yeah no. Like, no, no, no 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 i'm running I for just, my life yeah yeah i mean i think that that's that's another paradox that we have to overcome is like th- that everybody i mean understandably wants to survive you know like i not only do i want to survive but i want my life to basically continue the way it's been going um and and and, and, and when you think of that on like a macro level that's what all of America is kind of resistant to climate change in, in a way because it's like, well, it seems to say that we need to change how we live a little bit, right? We do, let alone um, staying behind, helping people. I wouldn't even stay behind to like save my business or mm. my home. I would yeah. just take my family and leave. I wouldn't even save my family. <laughs> I, I'm just running. I'm just. I'm just running. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, uh, some uh, I would save some of them. Um, all right. So thank you so much for joining thank me. You. I appreciate it. Yeah. 
Hey, how's it going? How's it going? Uh, what's your name? Noel. Noel, nice to meet you. Um, so, you know, we're talking about climate change up here. Uh, um, what do you think we need to do as a, as a, as an, uh, I mean, we, we can say we, we, you know, as humans is a big thing. How about New Yorkers? Like, what do New Yorkers need to do about climate change? Is it something you thought about in this class? Well, first off, they need to be more educated about it mm-hmm. because I feel that a lot of the younger generation doesn't know about the climate change. For yeah. example, when I came into this class, I didn't know much about climate change. Mm. In fact, this was all new to me. Yeah. So, yeah, that would be the first step to solving climate change. What about older people, though, too? It seems like young people, you know, are obviously the the important population in some sense because you guys are going to be controlling the culture, whether you like it or not. Uh, um, But what about what about older people? Do they need to be aware? It seems like older people are the kind of the problem in a lot of ways. Yeah. Like I told my father a few weeks ago, um, he didn't believe me. And he told me that I was being crazy. Uh, Yeah. 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 I'm not sure. Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's an uncomfortable thing to bring up at the dinner table, right? It's like, hey, guys, what are we going to do when, all, when the, the whole thing comes <laughs> down? What are we going to do when the ocean comes up into our, into our house? It's kind of an abstract conversation to a lot of people, yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, so uh, um, w- do you remember what you, you wrote in your letter to de Blasio? Was it about awareness, like the main idea? Yeah, I, I told him that, uh, um, as someone else said, that we need to educate the young again. Mm-hmm. And... We need to have a class required in high school to learn that kind yeah. of subject. Yeah. And I also told him that we need to implement seawalls mm. to help the people near the ocean. Yeah. They're just gonna their homes are just gonna be destroyed by it. Yeah. Yeah. No. It it seems like we the 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 coastal areas are the places that are going to be the most important. Uh, um. And we saw that really really powerfully with with Sandy. I don't know how many of you guys saw the. The, the photo of the uh, roller coaster in New Jersey, kind of like in the middle of the ocean, which is like a really like kind of disturbing image of like, oh, look, you know, a civilization that used to be here. And now it's it's sinking into the ocean. Um, was this was this uh, was this class like overwhelming or depressing to you or was it something that you that, like inspired you a little bit? Yeah. At first it was overwhelming to me because mm-hmm. it was like it just hit me. Oh, we might like this earth might not live for that long. Yeah. Because of how we're treating it. Right. But as I learn and learn, I'm more comfortable um, reading stories about it. Mm-hmm. And now I'm trying to tell my brothers and sisters about it so cool. they can also be prepared for it. Cool. That's, so that's what has to happen. Thanks so much for right, sitting down. You. Yeah. Hi. How's it going? What's your name? Salem. Salem. Nice to meet you. Uh, um, so climate change for you. What what is it? What is what is uh, what is happening? And 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 what what can New Yorkers do about it? Well, I I hear I hear about climate change before, like in, in high school, but mm-hmm. I saw it in uh, it, I didn't study the the subject as a uh, and uh, it from the economic angle. Mm. You just saw it like a science problem. Yeah, right. And um, and just gonna thank uh, Professor Justin for bringing the subject. It was a smart subject for me. For an English 101. Yeah, yeah. Because it's it's kind of brought you to learn more, you know, about like scientific and economics words mm-hmm. and through the, the class for global warming. I don't for New Yorkers. I don't. I see whatever applies for New Yorkers apply for the whole world. So yeah, I see the problem yeah. as for the whole world. It's not just for New Yorkers. Yeah, and it's yeah. We have to. We came up for to a problem which is might be a solution to it's um the agreement between countries mm, mm-hmm. to come up with like to reduce the emission or something like this yeah that's in the news right now actually like just today and the cover of the, to- the new york times is about uh obama and 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 trying to push uh uh lowering emission standards do you guys think that's is that like a is that is that do, do we have to in other words is it something that we have to depend on politicians for to change or is it something we have to do too well we have we have this problem that wh- whoever who has a power as Ju- professor justin said it during the class we have a Whoever has, has a power don't want to change mm-hmm. anything on it because mm-hmm. they making a profit out of it. Sure. And whoever who believe on it, they they don't have a power. Yeah. To do yeah. Anything. Yeah. And in order to have a to do something about it or have a leader to change things, he mm-hmm. has to talk and act. Yeah. It's not just it's because it doesn't make sense to come and give a speech, and then at the end of the speech you go and drive your car. And right. Mm-hmm. Right. It's, it's that's what's going to be hollow. 
Yeah, I, that's what's hard to overcome in a lot of ways is that is that you know we have a pretty comfortable lifestyle in a lot of ways in America, and, and cars are one of them. Cars are a part of that that comfort. And it's kind of a feeling like, well, how do we get people to give that up? You know, how do we people? How do we get people to change things that 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 are 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 that much a part of like how they define themselves in a way, right? Um, I like what you said about the uh, uh, the economic stuff because it seems like. Um, there has to be that element to it, right? That, 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 that maybe that's when you talk about climate change is not moving because people are profiting off of this stuff. It, you think that there's a way to like kind of change that so you could like profit off of saving, of, of going in the other direction? Does that make sense to you? Well, but if you, like as a suggestion, yes, I, I, I can come up with a suggestion, mm -hmm. but when it comes to action, yeah, it's, it's going to be the same thing. Like, yeah. Are we, I, I drive a cab. Mm -hmm. For instance, I drive a cab. Like, if it comes to the, you know, to the time where to reduce the emission, I, I for climate change, yeah. what am I gonna do? Yeah, like, right. I can't give up my job. Yeah, so no, I, 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 and that's another one of those kind of paradoxes that I think we have to, as a culture, think through. You know, because I, you know, I don't blame you for holding on to your cab. One, it's it's you know, it's economic. Uh, uh, um, it's it's economic security for you, but it's also uh, you know the cab is you know if the if the waters do rise, you can get in the cab and drive away, and it's like your <laughs> escape, uh, and not have to rely on the on the, the government buses on the side of the freeway. Um, thanks so much for Thank joining you. me. Appreciate it. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. What is your name? Fatima. Fatima. Nice to meet you. Um, so uh, how, how did uh, um, how did this class how did this class change your your ideas about climate change? It kind of turned me into an extremist, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. Um, it kind of opened my eyes because you know you hear about global warming all the time. We've been hearing about it for years, but we never really thought. I can't speak for any, anyone else, but I never really thought too much about it until, you know, hearing what's going on in the world and. Mm -hmm and how severe it really is at this point. Yeah, I mean, the, I think that's a theme here is that in, in the United States, you know, you can you can choose to ignore some of this stuff if you really want to, but in, in certain respects, for me, Hurricane Sandy was like, okay, you know, you can't ignore it because you lost internet access. And that's like part of like, you know, <laughs> kind of how you ignore it is like turning on the internet. Uh, um, do you think it has to impact people personally like that in, in order for them to change? I mean, did it impact you personally? It sounds like it was more like just hearing about it. Um, honestly, um, my boyfriend, he works for the MTA, so I know firsthand on mm. how bad Sandy really was yeah. in certain places and the extent of how unprepared New York City was and the fact that it was so sudden. Like, we experienced Irene before, and it was, uh, you know, it was a light Wasn't hurricane. Bad, it was like yeah. a heavy rain, and no one really cared about that. But even that light rain almost took the subway system out. So yeah. when the tunnels were flooding, I was just thinking, there are tourists outside taking pictures of this. Like, and there are people losing their houses and everything else. And it was just like a wake-up call. It should have been for a lot of people. Yeah. And people are just like, oh, you know, that's not going to happen again. Are you sure it's not going to happen again? It shouldn't happen the first time. Yeah. So I was just like, um, we're not ready for this. And I don't think the government is doing too much. I see in the papers now, you know, they're talking about, you know, climate change is an issue. Yeah, but y'all are saying it's an issue because people are going to lose their homes and be displaced. Y'all are talking about it's an issue because for military purposes or further, further down the line when mm -hmm. the world is just you know, apocalypse and running around and trying to defend yourself and food and water and they're That's talking we're about all cavemen again. that yeah. exactly to the to that point, but they're not talking about how to stop it from happening. Right. It's almost taken for granted that like this will happen and we'll deal with yeah. it when it when it does. I, I yeah, the the flooded subway tunnels I think is really disturbing. I don't know how many of you guys saw these photos of like the the water all the way up yeah, to like going underwater. like going yeah like going to the subway stairs and seeing that it's just like a swimming pool uh, or seeing cars floating in the water um, really did look like uh, um, movies you see about the end of the world. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, it, w do you remember what you wrote to Mayor De Blasio? I kind of criticized him at first because um, I compared him to Bloomberg and I was wondering what he was gonna do. You know, um, professor told me to be nice and <laughs> kind of like give him the benefit of the doubt because he's kind of a liberal. But 
That's um, what they say. That Yeah, that's what they say. Mm-hmm. But um, I suggested that, you know, like my other classmates, that awareness is key here because people like me, like, honestly, I really didn't care at first. Like, you know, I'm living my life. Like, I want to live in AC. Let's crank up all, keep all the lights on and, you know, and... Like, no one really knows unless they're aware. And if you're not going to build awareness, I was like, uh, come on, TV ads, posters. Y'all have all these subways. Throw them up. Let them know. Yeah, yeah. Um, give incentives, like I was, like Jeremy said, um, mm-hmm. to people with gas cars. But then, you know, Professor kind of crushed my dreams with that the other day because he said, yeah, you know, you have all everyone with electric cars, but, you know, now they're driving more because they're getting incentives for electric cars. So it's kind of like we're still going to have the emissions. So it's like... In my opinion, I'm like, we really have to do something really serious because even if we say, okay, let's drive electric cars that cut their emissions, mm-hmm. is that really going to help? Or do we really have to go yeah. really deep? Like, let's raise the price of cars. Yeah. Let's raise the price of insurance for cars. Let's raise the minimum age requirement for driving. Like, it has to be something really drastic for mm-hmm. it to stop. And if we do, like um, what Cecil said, with Plan NYC, with all the plans that they have, if we have all these plans, then, yeah, we need to start sharing them because y'all are only talking about New York City. What about everywhere else? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, there's it's not just New York, obviously. New York is just one place. And like, you talk about the, the, the tornadoes in the middle of the country, et mm-hmm. cetera. But, you know, it, it's hard because, like you said, you know, are you going to be the person that's sitting there feeling like a fool because you're sweating and there's no AC on and everyone around you has it on? And you're like, but I'm doing it because I'm climate <laughs> change and I'm sweating for, for the world here. Um, <laughs> it's hard to overcome that because, obviously, you know, like uh, – uh, um, uh, uh, you know, driving a cab, right, is, is, is part of your economic livelihood, then, then, you know, if you're saying, like, we're going to raise the prices on cars and make them, uh, sometimes I think it needs to be a cultural change, more kind of like just like if someone says they drive a car, everybody looks at that person as like, <laughs> you know, like you shouldn't do that. Uh, um, I don't know. It just seems like there's, you're right. There, I, I think I, I, I do agree with you that, that there needs to be radical change, but we're, we're not sure what exactly that is yet. Um, to be continued. Thank you so much for joining me. How's it going? I'm good. And what's your name? James. James. Nice to meet you. Um, so, you know, where are you at on all this climate change stuff? Is this something that was new to you? No, I was aware. But uh-huh. it, it gave me more information. Yeah. Because um, during Sandy, I was actually in New Jersey. Okay. And I have more knowledge in this class about New York mm, mm-hmm. and I was kind of envious yeah I wish I was in New York during the time because in New Jersey it was so much worse mm, were you like on the, near the coastline New Jersey no I was in a small town um Dover New Jersey at okay the time. and did it get hit hard by the by yes. the, the hurricane uh-huh. yes we lost power for at least two three weeks oh wow and I, I went I was dormant at a yeah. trade school okay and I could honestly say that was the worst time of my life what yeah. um what what did you do for two or three weeks without power? It seems like something we take for granted. For uh, I mean, we're sitting here with cords everywhere, right? And all this stuff plugged yeah, in. Nothing, just just sit. We, we would go to the school if yeah. we need anything because there they have Wi-Fi. Not not food really, but yeah. they'll have Wi-Fi and stuff. Because at the time, all the food out of my fridge spoiled. Mm-hmm. My phone was broken. Yeah. I went so any type of contact with my family was through Facebook, and I had to go to school for Wi-Fi and use the school computer. Wow! But I had no food. Um, the showers was gone. Like you could take a shower, but it was ice cold. Ice so cold. Yeah. I had to have baby wipes. Ugh. So I, I basically stink. I was hungry. I only survived on pop tarts and marshmallows. See, this time. is what we're talking about, right? Instant caveman. I mean, uh, the the veneer of civilization is so thin in in in, in America right now that you pull you pull out the plug. And all of a sudden, we're all eating each other. Uh, um, did you feel like you had help? Was there was the government around? No. No. Was there anyone that like when you went to the school? Like for instance, the school did the school have like things set up for people or no? It was the, just on, you're on your own. Did you feel very yeah, much on your own? Yeah. They they have a shelter. We just slept in the cafeteria. Yeah. I was lucky enough to to grab a couch. Yeah. But but wow. that was it. And one thing I could say is that I personally feel New York is ready yeah. or at least more ready than other cities sure sure yeah because when i'll talk to my mom or um other family members at everything we had was shut down yeah like even though the subways and buses which it mm-hmm. eventually came back mm-hmm. our trains it, if i wanted to come back to new york i had to wait at least two more weeks 
Wow. Yeah, and but so the, the, I would basically it, just stuck. It, it, it gives you a perspective because I mean it's funny because we're sitting here talking about like New York City as the place, but New York City did like kind of. It did. In some respects, like New York survived Sandy pretty well. Like we didn't have a lot of it. It, it, it wasn't like Katrina in the same respect, right? No. I mean, what you've and read. And then you have to think because even besides a natural storm, if you go when, when you sit in during winter and you see New Jersey and Pennsylvania school shut down, school shut down. Yes, yeah. It, it, it's because they they have they're nothing. not ready for yeah, that. Yeah, they, they're not ready. No plan. We we will get there soon. We see snow. It's like okay, time to get the shovels, but. Other cities are not ready for so any type of thing. Yeah, so in some respects, New York City might be one of the safer places to be, depending right. on where you are. Um, it's a really important idea, I think, because you know, even people out in Long Island in the suburbs. My my sister in law, she, you know, she, they lost power for two or three weeks, and they were, I mean, they they basically kind of moved into. Uh, uh, their parents' house that was in Brooklyn because they had power. They were like, well, I, I have to take a shower. I, I have to go to school, you know, like all that stuff. Um, it seems like it's going to, uh, it makes populations move a little yeah. bit, right? Did you feel like you had to, did you feel like you had to like escape Dover? You had to like go somewhere went, else? L- luckily, my roommate family came. Yeah. And they took me along with them to Pittsburgh for a few days. Uh-huh. But eventually we had to come back. Yeah. And I was happy while I was out there. But then when we came back, it was still it was still a dead town. Yeah, it was still. Were there a lot of people around, like talking about the issue while you were there? You know what I mean? Were there uh, people outside? Uh, um, no, um, I would say half the people evacuated. They left, or other people. Cause it was depressing. Yeah, because people would just sit. Cause I know when I come back to the dorm, everybody would be on the porch or yeah. Just, it, it was more like a far, forest area. They would just hang out in the woods. Yeah, and everything. It, it was really nothing to do. So. Wow, sounds like World War Two. In Dover, New Jersey. Unbelievable story. Thank you so much for, okay. for, for joining me. Yeah. Okay. okay. Is your name Kelly? Yeah. Nice to meet you, Kelly. How are you? Okay. Um, how, did, how did climate change come to you in this class? Was it something that you had heard about before? I mean, like, I heard about it, but like, I didn't really know like, that like, emissions of CO2 and stuff like that would cause it. And, like, I didn't think that. Like, I oh, you did, affected, you had heard about climate change, but you didn't hear about like the like what why we're yeah. why it's happening. Yeah. Um. N- now that you know a little bit about why it's happening, what do you what do you think we should do about it? I mean, like, I think like we have people like would drive to like the store or stuff like that, but they could walk. I think like more people need to like start walking more and mm. instead of like taking the train and driving and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, I come from the suburbs in California, and when we when I'm hanging out with my parents in California, they'll drive across the parking lot to the next store. You know what I mean? Like we'll come out of Costco <laughs> and we'll be like, oh well, we got to go to Home Depot. Let's drive over there, even though we can see the Home Depot. There's something cultural about that, right? It's like it's just easier. Um, do you think uh, uh, how do we how do we make people more aware? I think like, if you tell them like that, like by driving your car, like you're like a miss, missing, stu- uh, emitting CO2 into the air. Yeah, yeah. And like that, how you're affecting it, like by leaving your light on and stuff like that. Like, mm-hmm. Instead of telling them like, oh, it's happening, tell them like how they're causing it. Like, yeah. Did you uh, did you write a letter to De Blasio? Yeah. What what uh, what do you think New York needs to do? I think one of it was like telling people, like awareing them about like how they're affected, like what they're doing that causes it. Like, yeah. Letting them that it's part of the problem and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, the, people don't like to hear that, though, right? It's like if someone says, like, hey, you're ruining the world because you turn your light on late at night. And you're like, well, I'm up, you know, I got to have my light. And, like, there, there's that kind of thing that we all have, uh, you know, the, the way that we experience this, this world is, you know, the light switch is there. Uh, um, did you read Zaytoon? Yeah. Was that, was that a disturbing book to you? I mean, it was more, like, interesting, like, because okay, like, a lot of people left their animals and stuff like that. Like, oh, I the dog thing. Yeah. I forgot about the dog thing. I oh, I didn't want to remember that. So yeah. I would probably stay behind for my dog. So yeah. I yeah. Uh, uh, w- how about the uh, your attitude towards towards government? Did it make you f- feel a little more trepidatious about? I mean, yeah. Like, I feel like that they made people leave their animals and stuff like that. Like, they should have brought them, like, allowed them to bring it with them. I mean, like, yeah. my it dog's seem- part of my family, so I can't leave it. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the, the pet thing in Katrina was was incredibly disturbing aspect of it. Really, really sad that people left their animals and they felt, like, helpless. I think that's part of why climate change ends up being such an important thing to talk about is because we want to avoid people having to make decisions like that, right? Like, you shouldn't have to decide, well, i got to leave my dog or my kid behind or something like that. It's a horrible thing to, to, to have to consider. Um, do you think New York is, is ready for another for a Category 5 no, hurricane? I don't think so because, 
like after Hurricane Sandy, like the subways were off for like a few days. I feel like if a Hurricane Five happened, that they wouldn't be able to fix this. So. Yeah, no, I I, I think that uh, the subway seems to be a common theme here. Is that we all know. Uh, that the subway and buses are kind of the heart of the whole the whole project, and if we if we don't don't have those, what is New York City? It's kind of like pretty vital. Thanks for joining me. I appreciate it. Yeah. I just want to say a couple things. Please. Uh, the first thing when I was listening to James speak, um, it reminded me that when I was living in. Astoria, I think it was in 2006, there was a, a blackout. I don't know if anyone remembers that or if the year is correct, but... Um, 2004? I think it was post-Katrina, and Katrina was five. Oh, okay. And so I don't think it was... So the not the big blackout. No, no. Right. No, no. It wasn't the New York City blackout. It was like West, there was a Western Queens blackout. Yeah. And what had happened was the there was gentrification happening in Astoria that was putting a stress on the public services, and it was a con ed problem, so it wasn't a weather-related problem. And the uh, manhole covers like all started blowing out because the the infrastructure, the electric infrastructure of the of the neighborhood uh, was malfunctioning, and so basically all of Astoria lost power down through Long Island City. I don't think LaGuardia lost power though. I should Google that. I wasn't at LaGuardia in 2006, and I was living with my roommate uh, Todd. Mm -hmm. um, who now lives in the state of Washington, and both of us were in graduate school, uh, sort of on a very paycheck to paycheck uh, situation uh, because you know we were graduate school students. Both of us were making, I think, under thirty thousand dollars a year, splitting this little uh, tiny apartment on Forty Seventh Street in Astoria, and the, the, all the lights went out. And you know, and this is what I was thinking about when James was talking. I, r I thought the lights would come back on. Yeah. And so the first night it was kind of exciting, you know, because. You know, like, don't open the fridge, you know, it's yeah. all going to spoil. Uh, and by the next day, you know, you wake up and everything's still off. And, you know, the, the fridge is now spoiled, even if you left it closed. And so we had to start putting all of the food into these big trash bags. And the lights weren't coming on still. And we weren't getting any messages. And, you know, our phones were out. Um, and these were like, you know, this is, I think this might have been pre-iPhone, at least for me. So mm -hmm. yeah. I, I had probably just a very basic flip phone. There was no, nothing coming out of that. There was no TV. Uh, we didn't have cable. We, I don't even think at that time we had internet anyway. So I didn't have any information. And then when I went to the internet cafe that I used to use down by the subway stop, uh, the power was out there. And all of a sudden, in an instant, the only way that I knew what was happening was talking to other neighbors who were outside. Mm -hmm. And sort of, sort of, sort of in the manner that James was describing, um, but less in the way that I think happened in my neighborhood during Sandy. Th uh, this sort of human knowledge began to uh, be the way to get information about yeah. what was going to happen. And also, the rumors kicked in. Right. Um, and I remember people were bringing up terrorism as if that was in the air still in 2006. Like, uh -huh, definitely. This is somehow related to terrorism. And I was like, is it though? But maybe it is. You know, I, I was confused. And, you know, the long story short, um, the power didn't come back on for eight days. And about four or five days in, we realized we couldn't stay in the apartment because there was no way to save food. And so we, we ate through all the non-disposable food. All the food that was perishable was thrown away in trash bags. I mean, we threw away a couple hundred dollars worth of food. Um, and on about day three or four, the Red Cross showed up and opened up Red Cross cooling stations because this was like July or August. The temperatures were very hot. Mm -hmm. uh, all my old elderly neighbors were in their underwear in their front yards like <laughs> with umbrellas, like that's you a know, great opening shot of a movie about uh -huh. climate change. Like, why are all these old people outside yeah. in their underwear? And people were lining up out the Red Cross for hot meals. And then the, like, a paramilitary presence showed up. And there were, uh, you know, like, the, the kind of counterterrorism police at <laughs> Herald Square. Do you ever see them? Or Times Square? Like, yeah. They have body armor and, like, face masks and, like, M15s. Like, they can shoot 100 rounds a second. Yeah, those guys are cool. Uh, they were they occupied Ditmar's Boulevard in Astoria and Steinway mm -hmm. Street, so that every block there was just a, a troop trooper guy looking, you know, Captain America type figure, um, you know, and the Red Cross, and there were lines at meal times. There were lines down all the blocks of people lining up for hot meals and bottled water, and I remember at that point thinking. It's a dystopic cinematic scene that like I'm like. How this in. happened so quickly? Yeah, it just how did all it happen sudden, so quickly? Yeah. And there's this immediate dependence on counter-terror or slash paramilitary authority and 
this outside relief agency. And this is 2006, so the tsunami had been 2003 or 2004? 2004. And Katrina had been the previous year. And all of a sudden, I'm like, wait a minute. Like, I'm living in an environment that is now totalized by relief and military agencies. Yeah. And I, we had to leave. So we abandoned the apartment. And I had to sleep on friends' couches for the final three or four nights in Manhattan. Um, and... You know, I had to take a suitcase with me. And, you know, it was like a, in a very l- small way to what James was describing or what other people have felt um, with Sandy or even read about with Katrina. In a very small way, it was like my experience with displacement. Mm-hmm. And um, it was it was inconvenient. It was terrifying. It smelled really bad. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, it was hard to find a shower. Um, and th- the two things that I, I kind of would say is, as, a, as a conclusion to the story is one, Bloomberg didn't arrive until like day five or six. Yeah. And when he arrived, he was like, you know, we're about to turn the power back on. This is no big deal. And I remember feeling um, and hearing people were so angry with him. And there was just such uh, anger that he didn't show up until, you know, day five or six. And that he kind of batted it away. And like it was a news conference that he gave in Astoria. And he was basically saying, this is a low level situation. Whereas everyone who was experiencing it was um, not experiencing it that way. And there was palpable Anger. And I, do, I, yeah, I, I do remember this blackout now, yeah, and yeah. it was, and it was, and part of it was remembered, I think, because of the anger at Bloomberg. Yeah, for, yeah, and I, I think that. that's one of the takeaways that I have from the situation, which is, um, if you're in a situation in the future, or I'm in a situation in the future where those kinds of services are no longer available. It's not just what's going to happen if you know if you're Muslim in New Orleans mm-hmm. after 9/11. There's another feature to it, which is you know the way that people express their frustration in those moments can take many different forms. And you know, I think the the more chaotic situation is the situation where there's not a Bloomberg to direct your anger at. Mm. And I think that was what was lurking beneath the surface of Sandy. Had Sandy gone a different way, the other takeaway is my Con Ed bill was higher for that month than any other month of the year. <laughs> And um, we sent them a receipt for all the food that spoiled because they kind of like took the blame, and you know they reimbursed us I think up to a hundred dollars for like the, for like the food. Um, but my bill that month was like a hundred and seventy dollars, and I called them and I was like, we didn't have power for at least eight days. Yeah, you know I, I don't understand how there's a twenty percent, thirty percent, forty percent higher bill, and they had no response to that. And I remember thinking that's just complete corruption and that, you know, several people in the neighborhood were aware of that. Everyone had the same experience. Mm -hmm. Everyone kind of had to pay that bill. But we were we the people who were uh, frustrated by a failed Con Ed situation. We were the ones taxed for it. Yeah. You know, and I remember thinking, wow, they stiffed the people who got hurt with the money. Mm. You know, and I remember feeling I I felt deeply aggrieved as a graduate student making less than thirty thousand dollars a year before taxes. Yeah, I remember thinking I'm the I can't afford this. You know, like I'm I'm paycheck to paycheck. I can't even afford internet. And this 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 situation feels wrong to me. Um, Mm. So I I, I, those are sort of the kind of uh, personal experiences that I carry away uh, from from that situation. And I I worry about those kinds of things for the future. Yeah, and and if I can just like you know kind of wrap that up in in a sense that you know what what you're talking about is is uh, if you pardon the like corny pun is that it's powerlessness you mm-hmm. know what i mean like you're without power in 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 an electrical sense but you also feel powerless as a result of that right you feel like these are it's almost like god turns the lights on and off in a sense you know what i mean you don't ever see anyone do it it just happens like we, I, I, the, the few times we've lost electricity or water it's or hot water i don't know how many of you have lost heat or hot water uh, uh, and and just like turning on the sink when you come home to see is it hot yet did it come back on i've, I've lost for days and it feels like there's no one that's controlling this at all. It's just kind of like I'm just hoping some invisible hand turns it back on. Mm-hmm. And I think you know we have to if we're gonna if we're gonna approach climate change in any substantive way, we have to overcome that feeling of powerlessness. We have to realize that we are all equally empowered to do something about this. And that's kind of like how we whether where we find our outlet, you know, to plug in ourselves and and empower ourselves is kind of the key to what we're doing here around climate change. Well, you know? and I'll just my final thing would be I feel that way uh, being a member of the class and. So I, I, you know, with it being the last day, I've just had a terrific time with this class thinking through these very important issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fact that we've had this conversation uh, twice a week for two hours for 12 weeks, um, I think says a lot about the the uh, intellectual 
and emotional and spiritual uh, potential of the people in this room. Mm -hmm. And it's really the reason why I do this for a living is to have, you know, a semester long experience like this with so many talented people. And uh, I've learned a lot about the subject from everyone in this room. And I've had, you know, a really wonderful time uh, learning from everyone here and, and having the discussions we're having. And I'm very proud of everyone because this is tough stuff. I, I really don't think there's a there's a more difficult thing to talk about in terms of th the future of the planet and ways that we can f shape it. Yeah. And, and everyone in here, I think, has uh, proven to me uh, as a thinker and as a writer that they have great ideas. And I think that, you know, the more we take these ideas with with us all, uh, the better. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm hum but I'm I appreciate it, everyone. I'm, I'm humbled to have uh, been a part of your process. So thank thanks to everyone here. And, and and let me just let me just wrap up by saying I thank you all for participating. This this uh, this will go up on the internet at some point. I'll send links to to, to Justin. Hopefully you can find it. Uh, uh, the 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 podcast is called the Nostalgia Trap, and you guys are a part of it now. So thank you so much for 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 participating. Thank you.